and we are thrilled to welcome you in to our very first ever series review here on The Meltdown as we are looking at all eight episodes of Fallout, which launched on Amazon Prime. If you have not yet watched and binged the entire series, you may want to watch that first because we're going to be getting into all the spoilers that you can possibly handle when it comes to the Fallout television series on Prime. This is your first and your final warning that spoilers are straight ahead. I am Tim Melton, joined as always by the other half of the Meltdown. That is Mr. John Lunsford. John, are you looking overhead at some bombs that may be dropped as a result of the Great War? Making sure. No, it's under <laughs> my thumb, so I'm good. Look, I watched the trailer for this in our most viewed video we've ever done in our Fallout trailer reaction, and I knew none of the terminology. I knew none of the lore. I knew none of the games. I knew none of the history. And I asked myself, would that be something that I was interested in following the watching of season one? We'll get to that answer here in just a few seconds. But Tyler, you have been a fan of Fallout, and this actually pushed you over the edge to finally become an Amazon Prime member. Oh, yeah. So I was, I won't say staunchly against Amazon Prime, but I didn't see a point in me ever having that streaming service until the trailer for this dropped, and I'm happy I picked it up. This is a show that starts off, if you are a noob to the series like I used to be, you would think it was sometime in the 1950s in which this show started. It's actually 2077 is when the bombs drop. And the bulk of events within the Fallout series actually takes place in 2296. So there's a big time gap here. There's a big time gap between where divergence happens in our world and also where things pick up as we first meet Cooper Howard. This is a show that is funny, violent, smart, fun, rewarding, nostalgic, visually impressive, dark, but also kind of optimistic and hopeful, and it's very chemistry-focused. This is a show that's great at showing you character by character and then actually having them in the sandbox together. It hits on that note from just a TV viewer's perspective because, once again, I was not a huge fan of the series because I didn't know anything about it. We come at this from different perspectives. I didn't know anything about Fallout. John, you knew about Fallout, but didn't really like playing the games. And Tyler not only loved Fallout, but also played the games. Your thoughts on going into this series, maybe some apprehensions that you had being someone who wasn't a huge fan of the IP. Yeah, this is a game that it's big enough in the grand scheme of gaming pop culture that you have to get it right from the look of the vault, from the look of the pit boy to, you know, the, the mascot getting the perfect look there. And, um, you know, then learning that, you know, Cooper Howard was basically the mascot, you know, that there's, there's little things like that, that, um, you had to get right. And I think they got that right. Episode one, part of what I liked of, of episode one, it may be my favorite episode of the whole thing is just, that's the getting it right part that they nailed the getting it right part. Then the story's fine after that, but like, I thought that was good enough that that made me say, okay, I'm in for this series no matter what happens episode two and beyond because you got that part right. And so when it comes to a video game adaptation of any kind, you got to get it right. So just knowing the, the basics, having played Fallout 3 only and a quick playthrough of that, um, I knew the basics and I knew what you had to get right and what you could potentially get very, very, very wrong. And they got it right. I am a gamer, but Fallout was never a series that I invested any time into as mentioned. So I had five questions going into this experience. Number one, as someone who hasn't played the game, would I be completely lost? And I can say for a fact that I was not completely lost. Every little bit of tidbit of information I got made me more interested in the world. My second question, would it make me care about the series timeline's very intricate history and then also have me become invested in the future timeline? And the answer to that is a resounding yes. I started studying up on the history that led to the events of the bombings. I started then getting into, well, what could the future of not only this series, but of the timeline that's been explained so far look like? Number three, would the on-screen performances actually be given the focus they deserved? Or would the series rely too heavily on the zaniness of the world? And in my opinion, it was a perfect blend of both character development and and the world interfering with those characters in their quests constantly. Number four, would the constant old school soundtrack become endearing or annoying? For me, I loved the music in this series and how it was used. It was something that hit all of my senses. And while these aren't songs that I'm going to have on my playlists, 
for how they were used as almost a cheerful, American, optimistic, overabundance of feeling that classic sense of nostalgia intertwined with some really jarring imagery. I think that balance was perfect. And number five, would I feel like there were actual stakes in the action or that everyone in the series would be far too safe the entire time? And I felt like our main characters could turn any corner and be eaten up by anything in this world at any time and that they were absolutely at risk. John, did you have that same sense of vulnerability from the main characters in this? Yes, because I feel like there's enough vaults out there. And the the storyline I became most intrigued with was what's in Vault 31 of you could literally pick any character from a vault, send them out into the world and follow their story. And that could be it because there's a million things we still haven't seen from this, um, especially with, hey, you know, he goes to Vegas at the end. Well, New Vegas is a game that exists. So you have a perfect storyline to potentially jump off that game in the in the uh, I guess it wouldn't be a sequel, but in the second season. Yeah. Um, that, you know, I felt like, look, you could have killed everybody and still been fine to do a second season, or you could have kept everybody alive, which, for the most part, they the main characters, they kept all alive and do a second season that way. Um, you know, the, the confusion of the vault dwellers coming out into the world, you had to make it where they didn't adapt easily. You had to make it where, because in the game, you're having to very much go through houses and find little bits of lore and learn slowly but surely because you've been taught a very set curriculum and, and you know, you come to find out that, you know, the vaults were used as different like experiments and stuff like that. So what each vault was taught was different also, but you know, the confusion had to play with Ella Purnell's character to be confused the whole time, but also be able to hold her own in a fight and everything. And I thought she did that very well, as well as Walton Goggins did with his role, as well as Kyle McLaughlin did with his role and all the other characters. This is a darkly funny series of not only games, but also season one of this show. That tone had to be right. Did they get it right in your opinion, Tyler, as a fan of the series already? So for me, that first episode is just the uh, Leonardo DiCaprio pointing meme. I'm just going, oh, look at that, look at that. <laughs> they hit everything from the sugar bombs uh, cereal to Blamco mac and cheese to the cartoon that briefly plays at the birthday party, uh, Grognak the Barbarian. There you have it. All of that's in the game. The look of the computer terminals, they nailed it. The look of the Pip-Boy, it, it felt like I was just watching a playthrough of Fallout. Yeah, hey, if, or if Fallout had cutscenes, would be a little more accurate. Pass me a Nuka-Cola while you're at it, please. Can you throw one over here? I'm just I'm I kidding. wish we had we some. Don't, we don't have any Nuka-Cola, but the bottle caps obviously being the currency in this world that is so valuable. As noted by the Deadline team, the Fallout series comes from Westworld creators Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy. John, you've been on record saying Westworld Season 1 is the greatest season of television in the history of television, in your opinion. Fallout had obviously a lot of weight on it from your vantage point, given how much you love Westworld. How much credit do you give Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy for making this not only something that rewards fans, but non-fans alike? Um, I give them pretty much all the credit. I'll give a little credit towards, you know, Todd Howard and Bethesda as well for letting their uh, IP be used this way and, and not interfering, you know, too much because sometimes you could see people like that maybe interfere too much with their game. Um, but, you know, they have done good work before. Obviously, uh, Jonathan has worked with his brother, Christopher, in, in various ways as well. Um, but Westworld, one of the things Westworld got great was it made me believe the tech that exists in that world could actually be a thing. And Fallout is a world that the tech, even though it's in 2077 and the TV looks like an old tube TV from the 50s, but there's also a robot butler as well floating yeah. through the air. It's like, how do these two things coexist um, unless it's an alternative 1950? No, it's an alternative 2077. Um, they made the tech work in this, you know, because you start to ask, uh, the questions you start to ask is like, well, how do they build these vaults? The, I think the one question that wasn't fully answered in this that yes, you have other shows you could potentially, you know, other seasons you could potentially explain this is, it sure seems like everybody was caught off guard, minus the vault tech people maybe, was caught off guard with the bombs going off. So how many of those vaults were completely filled when the bombs went off? How many of those vaults had to, people had to scurry and get in there? The whole point was they were trying to sell vaults for when the bombs drop, you can go hop in your vault. Right. So there's a lot of like timeline in there that's not necessarily explained, but the technology 
was explained really well. Um, the basics of the game were done really well. So being able to adapt, because Westworld is an adaptation too, being able to adapt that very well and then create your own story with that like they did with Westworld, uh, I give a lot of credit to both of them. Ella Purnell as heroine Lucy retains her blithe spirit even outside the posh bunker she leaves for the first time in her life to search for her kidnapped father. She said, quote, what I like the most about her is just relentless optimism, which could get annoying, but somehow because of these amazing writers, the way they fleshed out the character, it doesn't. I hope. Yet. I didn't find Lucy to be annoying whatsoever. I actually found it to be quite refreshing. Purnell said that in her first meeting with showrunner Graham Wagner, he described her character as being Ned Flanders in the apocalypse. And I think that sounds like <laughs> it's, it's accurate. pretty accurate for what was uh, being shown on screen there. That doesn't sound like maybe on paper that it would be a good mix, but it delivered in the series for sure, Tyler. Oh, yeah. It was it was great. She's talking about like uh, Walton Goggins not following the golden rule as he's trying to like almost drown her to attract a gulper to get back the bag. And it's just a very funny tone to have. Vault dwellers and surface dwellers, two different classes for sure in this series and two groups that don't necessarily have the most respect for the other. And it really does create a lot of the conflict for this show in the uh, post-apocalyptic setting after the bombs have been dropped and we advance so many years into the future. Once we saw Lucy leave the vault, for me, my entire interest there went to the surface and what was happening there. And every time we went back to the vault, I was a little bit disappointed. I kind of wanted to stay on the surface and see what was happening there. Did you have that same sort of feeling, John, or did you find it all to be very interesting every time that they took that trip back to the vault, even without Lucy there? No, every time they went to the vault, I got more interested at that point, because like I said, the one storyline I was most intrigued with was what is in vault 31. Now I thought the why behind what was in vault 31 was very good. I feel like the, it's all the people frozen. That was kind of actually kind of a letdown. Um, But the why behind it and explaining more from the Cooper Howard timeline as opposed to the Ghoul timeline Mm -hmm. was more uh, intriguing. That's, I would almost watch an entire show of, from the point we last saw, uh, you know, Cooper Howard hearing his wife, hey, we're going to drop the bombs on purpose and all that kind of stuff. I'd almost like to see an entire show or a movie or whatever, just of that until the bombs dropped that with nothing from the current current time of, you know, 200 plus years in the future to then see, I, I said this was star Wars, something I really wanted more after the prequels, even though the prequels aren't super well received necessarily was I want more of like the political drama that led to the emperor getting to where he was. And we got that in a show like Andor that I now see the political side of things with Mon Mothma and going to the Senate all the time. And, uh, you know, the political thriller side of that, I'd like to see that as well from the fallout universe. I think there's a lot of intrigue right there that that then gets brought back to the vault side of things. Cause that's how you ultimately find that out. It does bring it in obviously to, you know, Walton Goggins character in present day as well. But the vault, every time they went back to the vault, it's like, Tell me more about how we got to this point. See, and that's what I feel like. There's three stories here, right? There's before the bombs have been dropped. There's what the vault dwellers are doing. And then there's what the surface dwellers are doing. That's really sort of where we're at. And I love two out of three of those aspects. I just couldn't really get too enamored with what was going on in the vaults after Lucy left. But that's just me. How about you, Tyler? So I was going to say my interest in the different storylines in this actually correlate to my interest in the storylines in the game. I've always been super interested in vault tech and the lore behind it, as well as just exploring the wasteland and seeing the ghouls, the gunslingers, and all that. Do not care about the Brotherhood of Steel. Still don't. See, that's another part is I thought uh, Aaron Moten, I guess I say his last name, who's kind of an unknown coming in. Plays Maximus. I, I liked his role. I liked his role probably the best for what he is. I already know Walton Goggins can be funny, can play action, can do whatever, but like from Ella Purnell, who's not small time. She's done plenty of things before, but from comic law and all those other people, then the brotherhood of steel storyline really stood out more to me with his character, Maximus from, Hey, I'm, um, taking out, uh, what's the guy's name? Michael, uh, uh, Rappaport. When he, when he took out, that's a random person to have in the show. It was, it was when funny he, though. When he took out Michael they Rappaport, have a lot of random people in this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, then takes over. Yeah. Chris Parnell randomly playing a Cyclops. Um, 
Whenever you saw anybody in that armor cursing, it was funny every time. I don't yeah. care. It's the voice just doesn't correlate with the action of like, you know, it's just so funny. And I, I thought that that hit so well. But like, I thought his whole, his whole mentality of like, you think the vault dwellers are, you know, the most uh, reserved and unknowing of the world. Really, the Brotherhood of Steel is because when they fall down that tunnel and it's like, you want to have sex and he has no idea what she's talking about, that shows he's even more reserved and knows less about the world than she does. And she's been locked in a vault for, for her entire life. That, that aspect of it intrigued me very much. Obviously, when they put the armor on, you know some stuff's about to go down. Um, that there's a lot of angles of, hey, how did this get to this point? that I would like to also see with the Brotherhood of Steel as well. Moten said about his role in Fallout, quote, I was happy to get the opportunity to play a person who's just as afraid as he is brave, just as truly a hero as he's pretending to be one. And that pretty much sums that up. Let's talk about the finale here. A recap published by Variety recounts that in the Fallout Season 1 finale, cleverly titled The Beginning after the series premiere was called The End, escaped vault dweller Lucy discovers who dropped the first nuclear bombs back in 2077. It was vault Tech, the creators of the underground bunkers that Lucy and her family grew up in. In another twist, her father, Overseer Hank, is revealed to be a former vault Tech employee who had been cryogenically frozen and reanimated hundreds of years later. Tyler, did you see this twist coming, or was this something that was completely out of left field for you when you were watching the series? Uh, this kind of... Came out of nowhere for the most part. You could see where it was heading when they started focusing more on uh, uh, Barb, Barb, mm -hmm. uh, Cooper's wife working yep. at Vault Tech. And you could kind of see, oh, maybe they are trying to fund the conflict a little bit and create a reason for people to buy the vaults. But uh, I thought it built on the lore of Vault Tech so beautifully. I love this. Yeah. In the finale, there is, Tyler just mentioned, a flashback to pre-nuclear 2077 shows a secret meeting between Vault Tech and other Vault companies scheming about keeping their businesses afloat. The Cabal is worried that current peace talks would render their products useless, so they decide to drop nukes themselves to guarantee their vaults will become money makers. You've already talked about your interest in this storyline, and I'm right there with you, John. It was the most captivating thing I saw, I think, in the entire series, minus the performance of Walton Goggins, who's also a part of this storyline. But this right here was a literal bombshell of what we saw in the series finale, and I loved every minute of it. Yeah, and... and with that, like learning also, like I said, the Vault 31 thing was my most intriguing, hey, what is this? And that's where all these people basically ended up going was to basically cryogenically freeze themselves until they were, you know, brought in to be the overseer of Vault 33. Um, so the, the thing with Fallout lore that has always kind of sort of intrigued me, even though I haven't really played the games, is what each vault's experiment was. Because their whole thing is we're trying to experiment on people. And I've, I've gone through since the show and found – some of the craziest things like one vault had one woman and a thousand men, one vault had one man and a thousand women. Then one vault had where you had to elect um, a new overseer every year. And at the end of that year, they got killed. So you knew you were going to get killed as long as you were overseer for the year. And they got down to five people and then they refused to vote somebody in. And then a message displayed in their vault saying, congratulations, you decided to value human life more than power of being the overseer. You get, you get to live after everybody else, the entire vault had died. There's a ton of experiments out there. That's why when I get to the vault side of things of that twist of like, not only we're we going to drop the bombs, but all those other people that are sitting in that room, kind of like a presidential, like, you know, uh, war room, crisis room kind of thing. Like what are each of these experiments that all of these people are jumping in on to ultimately try to benefit from for the future of humanity that we really saw the absolute most normal one portrayed here that once you go to Vegas, in season two, assuming that's where you go because that's where Kyle McLaughlin went, then, you know, what's the experiments going on there? What all kind of experiments are going on? Because it's only going to make Voltec look a billion times worse once all that actually comes out. You mentioned there the character of Hank and that shot we see towards the end. It's also revealed that Moldaver had invented cold fusion in the pre-nuke days and it helped Lucy's mother and kids escape to Shady Sands when she learned the truth about Hank. However, Hank eventually found the kids and found the wife and decided to take them back to vault 32, the kids and then decimated shady sands, turning Lucy's mother into a ghoul who then Lucy herself has to take out and put out of her misery. That's some deep familial 
trauma happening yeah. right there in that final. You got all of this in the final few frames of the season. You got the reveal about what happens with Cooper Howard and his wife. You got the reveal about the family drama that Lucy's encountering. You got the reveal about what season two could possibly lead to if you were a betting man right now john not only should you be playing at my bookie but you would i assume also be betting that there will definitely be a season two here oh well i mean i feel like the even from the actual players of the game now yes if you're a hardcore person you can find fault at it if you really want to but it seems like the average person has liked it um people on our show and our chat have been talking about it people on the next round which is all sports have been talking about it i mean there, there there's people of all walks of life that have been talking about it I can only assume plenty of people are subscribed to Amazon to watch this or potentially bring in new subscribers, which obviously is the point. You want to bring in more uh, subscriber money that you'll have a season two and then the lead off to Vegas. You don't have to go to Vegas necessarily, but I feel like new Vegas is one of the better received games to where ultimately you want to try to live out that storyline. It's considered a classic. And towards the end of season one, we start to see some conflict between the new California Republic and the brotherhood of steel. Yeah. New California Republic plays a huge part in the new Vegas game. So I do expect to see them. I do think that there has been some controversy about a chalkboard and a date that was written on there from diehard fans of the series with the destruction of Shady Sands and when that was actually when that actually occurred. Yeah, that was in that vault four when they went down in there. That it that's the thing. I feel like one thing you have to pull out of this is every vault very much learned their yeah. own thing to where there is a history that actually happened, but some vaults may teach a history they were told to teach by vault Right. To okay. where whatever may be in Vault 4 versus what we see in Vault 33 or what you've seen in Vault 101 from the game or whatever. It may be an unreliable narrator right. situation. It could be and there's a lot different. of fans that have lost their mind over it. It's different on purpose, too. It could be there. Um, the biggest Easter egg we saw, like mentioned, the New Vegas skyline that Hank gazes upon in the distance. And once again, while another season has not yet officially been greenlit, I would expect that announcement sometime soon, actually. By Prime, a recent report by the California Film Commission revealed that Fallout has been approved to relocate to California and earn tax credits to shoot a second season. So if you're looking really into the weeds, it appears as if everything's moving forward in that capacity. I've got to ask this question because it's one thing that's been on my mind. I haven't looked it up or anything. Tyler, you probably can tell me all about it right here off the bat. As Hank escapes in his power armor, we see a horned skull of a death claw. As a non-Fallout player, it seems like a lot of people are excited about the Death Claw. Tell me about what a Death Claw is. So this is one of the few creatures we didn't get to see that I was super excited to see on screen. A Death Claw, it is, it's a big horn sort of reptilian monster that can burrow underground, and they are a nightmare. You don't want to deal with them. If you see one, run the other direction. They're bad news. Gotcha. We saw Ooh, that thing's called a death claw. I'm going towards it. <laughs> we saw a lot of things in this series. Uh, that would be one way to live life or not live for much longer if you're doing that. But I can't wait to see that. It's another thing that's been teased in a season two. This is going to become one of the most anticipated season twos of all time because this is only going to continue to grow. Really quickly, I want to talk about the release strategy. This is one place where me and John, I think, will differ on this series tremendously. And that is, I think, to build more and more conversation, it should have actually been episodic week to week to week to week in order to build up some level of long-lasting communication about the series. I worry that no one's going to be talking about this series in a few weeks even, John, and that it could have extended its life by being weekly. You, however as a consumer and also as someone who thinks it's the best strategy for other consumers is all about the drop eight, all, all eight episodes at once. Um, I just wonder from the casual perspective, and I would not consider any of us casual just from what we do consuming this content, not necessarily that we're all fallout fans, that there would be some drop off because a show like halo releases episodically, and I still have not finished it, even though it's been finished for like a month now, um, you know, as of us talking about this. There's a lot of shows that when it's episodically, really outside of that Sunday HBO Max, 8, 8, 8 p.m., 9 p.m. slot, that it's hard for me to commit to watching whenever it comes out. Um, Disney Plus shows when The Mandalorian has done that, and it's, you know, Wednesday or Thursday or something like that. It's usually the weekend before I can watch it, if even then, or I get behind some. That then I understand the, the eight weeks versus one week, thing but that by the time I finish and I'm like oh, I finally finished guys because it drug out so long that the then by that point the moment has passed 
from I finished 12 weeks in as opposed to eight weeks that it it holds me off instead of, hey, this is coming out this weekend. I have a good weekend where I can watch it because I had a good easy mm-hmm. weekend where I could watch it. I could consume it. We could sit here and talk about it wherever if it's eight weeks in the future. I'm about to have surgery in a, in a few weeks that I, I'm going to end up missing. I'm totally out of, out of the loop at that point. It burns bright, but it burns quick when there's eight episodes just dropped like this instead of a slow burn. And it's just, to me, I, I just, I do wonder how many people are going to be still talking about this in a few weeks. Tyler, which, which sort of version of this release schedule do you prefer? It's tough because normally I'm an, I, I prefer things to release episodically week by week because I think it gives everybody a chance to see it and have a conversation about each episode. And I think that's what gives a lot of shows uh, longevity. But for this one, I kind of just wanted to knock them out one after another because uh, a lot of the mysteries don't really get solved in one episode. It it takes a while. so It kind of depends on the type of show too. Yeah. So for me, Stranger Things, which is maybe the biggest example of releasing all at once. because I'd rather what, binge that. That's what Netflix does. Stranger Things for me was the first show I remember watching thinking, man, I feel like I just watched an eight-hour movie. Like, it legitimately was one movie, even though it had episodes to it. That a lot of shows don't do that, and especially that's falling from the network TV side of things mm-hmm. where you have 20-plus episodes and you got to drag it out and you got to have some episodes that have nothing to do with the overarching story or whatever. Or it's a show like SVU where everyone's his own contained story and you don't really care about the overarching story. Like there, there's just different types of shows. So for like network shows, I get it. For some shows, even on streaming, I get it. Stuff like this, like when I sit down and play Fallout or a good game that I enjoy, then I want to play it and I want to beat it. Not as fast as possible, but I want to enjoy the whole thing at once. And it right. may be over the course of a weekend. It may be over the course of a week or two. But it's not like I'm going to play 30 minutes here and then come back the next week and play 30 minutes here and then come back and play 30 minutes here. I want to play the whole thing. So when it comes to something like a video game, and I would say the same thing for The Last of Us, even though it was episodic, I would have loved to have enjoyed the whole thing if I could. But once again, that's one of those HBO, you know, 8 p.m. Right. Sunday slots. But overall, something like this is like how, how I'd want to enjoy a video game. Fallout, we we all approve of, and we'll get our final grades here in a second. Letter grades, that's what we'll look for. I just think House of the Dragon is going to be one of those things that swoops in in June, and it's not going to necessarily erase Fallout because Fallout will be out of the talking points by then. But it's going to be something that lingers with us and stays with us week after week after week. But as John mentioned, that is HBO's model, and they have perfected it for sure. They've almost cornered the market on that. I want to run through just a couple of more things about Fallout really quickly here. Quick thoughts on whether it was thumbs up or thumbs down in the way they handled it. We've kind of already gotten to a couple of these, but just as a final sort of thought on Fallout Season 1, since we can get into full spoilers, the first thing I'm going to go alphabetically here, I'm going to go with the Brotherhood of Steel, a militaristic religious cult group who are obsessed with restoring order on the surface. They collect knowledge but aren't exactly forthcoming about sharing it with others, and one of the main characters of the series, Maximus, played by Aaron Moten, is a part of this group. Tyler, tell me again why the Brotherhood of Steel didn't quite work for you. It just, uh, it never clicked for me in the game. It, it's just like, okay, it's like a Fighters of Venture Guild, I guess. But I never really got into any of the lore behind the Brotherhood of Steel. And mm. also, I've never been a big fan of the power armor. That's going to be controversial, I think. I but, think that will be a little controversial. But I've, n- I've never been crazy about the power armor. I like I like sneaking around in the game. John, I don't know Fallout very well, but I knew that power armor before even having seen the show, that it was associated yeah. with Fallout. You love the Brotherhood of Steel. Tell me why it worked so well in the series for you. Well, in the same way, I feel like people look at a Death Claw, which are giant, big, horn monsters. This is a giant, big metal monster, like... Watching, uh, you know, the, that armor versus a death claw. I mean, it's like watching Pacific Rim or something like that with the, you know, the Jaegers and, and Kaiju. Like, that's just, I mean, just look at that. I mean, <laughs> when that he giant first, armor, anything about that, when it gets into a fight, you know it's going to be fun to watch. When Maximus first puts it on and he starts wrecking shop, you know, with bricks and stones and, like, you know, cursing, and there's like a, you know, he's getting all excited and you can see, it's funny, it's funny. And w- watching the death of our first armored individual and the way he goes down with that mutant black bear or whatever it is. Something like that. Yeah, it, it was, was just some sort of mutant bear. Insanely funny. And it should have been a lot darker, but it was insanely funny. Okay, how do you think, John, that they handled the ghouls? You're not a big horror movie fan. You're not a big zombie fan. These are the zombies of this universe. How do you think they handled just the ghouls 
in this season of television? Um, so, I mean, really, it's Walton Goggins, and that's pretty much it. I know uh, his uh, squire turns into one at the end, but that's really the main ones you see that I thought was fine. I mean, I honestly don't remember them that much from the game, but, you know, the the healing aspects of it and everything, you know, I thought from a – CGI standpoint was done well, and from overall, how people view them was done decent. The ghouls were pretty menacing right before Goggins went in there to ingest all those drugs yeah. and what they were yeah. doing wrecking shop. Oh, building full of feral ghouls. What would you think of the feral ghouls? Because that's part of why Goggins is trying to do what he's doing in this, to remain non-feral. Oh, yeah, that's an entire sort of topic of the Fallout backstory itself, the fact that there are some people so horribly irradiated that they look like Walton Goggins, and then there's some of those people who get radiated like that that completely lose their sense of reality and start going feral and eating anything they can. It was truly terrifying to see on screen. I thought they handled that as a fan of zombie movies really, really well. Uh, The Great War, learning more about the history of the Great War, I was really entrenched with trying to figure out more information about the backstory of what led to the bombs being dropped. We see snippets of sort of the conflict that led up a lot of it there in the final episode of this series. Is this something you're circling back to John and trying to learn more about these periods that make up the fallout storyline from the fifties in which we experienced divergence to the great war and all of that? Yeah. I mean, I definitely want to know from the, Hey, let's just us drop the bombs to the bombs actually dropping and everything that happens in between that, that once the bombs drop, well, it all kind of goes to hell at that point, And then we can pick up, 200 plus years in the future with what happens. But um, I am very curious from basically bomb drop back um, from what we know, I guess, to bomb drop what happens in that time. And Tyler, the gulper, this was a creature that made a big impact was Lucy was being used as bait for the gulper, a great character design, something from the games themselves and something that was really menacing in this and was comedic, but also really terrifying. Oh yeah. I, and I would put most of the fallout creatures in that category. They're uh Kind of funny, but also horrifying. Um, I was glad they included the gulper. Would have liked to see some Meyer lurks, some death claws, as we talked about earlier. Super mutants. I was really surprised we didn't see any of those in the game. You saw uh, one's hands as they were uh, wheeling it off, I guess, the Enclave. That was a super mutant, I think. In the gotcha. series, yeah. I, John, the, the vault dwellers that we ran across, I'm trying to remember the character actor's name, Chris Parnell. Is that right? Yeah, that was the Cyclops. That was the Cyclops. Yeah, I from mean, SNL. What did you think of just the all different types of vault dwellers in which we saw? Because these are also known as vaulties or vaulters, but they come in all different shapes and sizes for sure. They do. Obviously, you know, that was a vault that brought people in from the surface. So he's like, oh, I'm a fifth generation. I've been here the whole time. But his, you know, five generations ago, they came down and then ultimately became vault dwellers. Um, you know, the vault dwellers themselves, I don't care about as much as the experiments those vault dwellers were then put into that then could affect how, you know, what kind of vault dweller they ultimately became. They were became. guinea pigs, yeah. They were basically guinea pigs. So kind of seeing that, um, it's kind of more what I would like to see more so than the actual people themselves. Imagine spending all that money on a vault and all you are is a human test subject for sure by vault tech. Yeah. And finally, we're going to end with the wasteland. They had to make this place seem like anything could happen in it at any point they had to create a world in the wasteland or at least replicate that adapt it to where it was a truly terrifying place to be and you felt like danger was lurking around each and every corner and even the pleasant people that you run across can rob you of your drinking water or can uh, be a raider out there that's looking to do some real damage to you and that sense of danger was something the series got very right I want to get to our final grades on Fallout Season 1. For me, it is going to be an A-. minus. The production quality, insanely good. I think that the adapting it to make non-fans of Fallout fans of Fallout was its most important challenge, and it got that right, while also giving enough fan service and enough Easter eggs to keep Fallout fans excited about what they were seeing. I give this series... So far, after season one, an A- minus with what it was able to accomplish. Darkly funny. Walton Goggins has not gotten his flowers in the appropriate way for me on this podcast, but he steals every scene he's in. He's wonderful in playing both Cooper Howard and in The Ghoul. And I loved seeing that entire character arc, even though it was nonlinear, being explored. 
I totally bought into his performance, and I think that he was the standout of the show. So an A- minus for me. John, what grade are you giving Fallout Season 1? Oh, I need now is for him to put his clogging shoes on and uh, merge Baby Billy and Cooper Howard. Yes, be haven. Um, also, you mentioned the wasteland and the people within it. I would love to see a spinoff of uh, Fred Armisen's DJ. And <laughs> yeah. why on earth? Fred Armisen showing up was great. Yeah, that was. Why great. on earth he's still DJing for you know a radio station that nobody's listening to except that one poor kid? Um, I would give it a solid B plus. Um, it it has its moments. Like I said, episode one probably was my favorite. So technically, to start and kind of go down, not that it would like tanked or anything it was still a good show overall um you know i like the brotherhood brotherhood of steel and i feel like it was very much the third kind of storyline behind the vault dwellers and then of course with uh cooper howard but um i give it i give it a b plus b plus for john and i think he's championing just want this on note the most violent episode of the entire series in episode one i believe he is (laughs) so just putting that on record uh tyler what would you give a final grade for fallout season one what would it be from you it's so hard for me to find stuff wrong with this. I, I just have to give it an A. I, I'm being picky. I want to see some death claws, some super mutants. But for weapons, uh, we're only really missing the Fat Man and Little Boy mini nukes. We got to see the junk jet. I've got it in my notes. Junk jet, let's go. Uh, it's one of the most amazing weapons in the game. You just pick up trash and shoot it at your enemies. I think there's a lot of you probably right now wondering where you can gamble away or gamble for to achieve some more bottle caps in your life. Well, you don't have to wait for New Vegas. You can go to our friends. That's our title sponsor, MyBookie. Go to MyBookie.ag, use promo code next round and uh, get a first deposit bonus. Get a few extra caps on us there. And you can also bet on uh, hockey, basketball, baseball, football season starts up. You can bet on that. You can play in the live casino. You can play slots. Do anything you want. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with our friends at MyBookie.ag. That's going to do it for our season one review of Fallout. What did you think of the series? Maybe you were a fan of the video games already and you thought that this was a faithful adaptation, or maybe you had never learned anything about the Fallout history before you ended up watching this, and it just engrossed you as a powerful, captivating season of television. We'd love to hear from you in this comment section below as we all gear up for a hopeful season two. That's going to do it for us here on The Meltdown. Join us daily, live, 2 o'clock Central, 3 o'clock Eastern.